Can you hear that? That chirping? That is a kingfisher, one of the many residents of the Rye River in Kildare. The kingfisher eats other rye residents, species of small fish and larger aquatic insects that it catches by plunge diving from a perch into the rye. The kingfisher, like a lot of wildlife along the rye, isn't always easy to spot. But they're there, among the branches in the trees, in the banks of the rye, and in the rushing waters of the river itself. Birds, insects, fish... They're all there living their lives, oblivious to the hustle and bustle of the wider world. Today, we're going to hear all about those inhabitants. I'm Liam Garrity, and this is Stories from the Rye. Well, the Rye has a very interesting passage through Leakslip, of course, because the, the Royal Canal flows over the top of it in a great aqueduct, which is still one of the great civil engineering feats of the early 19th century. Our guides today are both passionate about wildlife and the natural world. Well, I'm Anna Nilauna, and I do lots of things about wildlife, I suppose. I, I broadcast on the radio, I write things about it in magazines, and I take people out on field trips and all of that sort of thing, really. Well, I'm Richard Collins. I am a contributor to the Mooney Goes Wild program for the last, oh, how many? 25 years, 24, 25 years. So we are in safe hands. The first thing I wanted to do is find out what kind of wildlife might you expect to see should you find yourself, like me, strolling along the banks of the Rye. Aina says it all depends. It would depend on the time of year, it would depend on the time of day, and it would depend on whether you had a dog with you or whether you were with yourself. So, you know, there are all of these considerations. So let's take it that you might be going for a walk along the river at this time of the year, say, now this is January, we're doing this the first week in January, and if you were to walk along the river at this stage, you probably would encounter, you know, if it was a decent river, which the Rye is and has lots of trees along, along the banks of it, you would encounter, first of all, the vegetation, the trees themselves, in fact. I'm just thinking, I don't know what it's like, well, it's like where you are when the Rye River is, but certainly it's been so cold these last few mornings that you get hoar frost on the trees. You get this beautiful bare trees because they've got no leaves and got all of this lovely white frost on them, which can, can look very nice. So if you're up early enough for that, it's a visual feast rather than anything else. <laughs> Of course, walking along the Rye, there is wildlife you can see, but also some you can't. Well, now, Liam, you've hit the nail on the head when you say seen and unseen. Unseen, yes. And most of the wildlife is there and you never see it, you know. There is the familiar and the exotic in this thing. Now, this river, the Rye, Amunlaree, is a lovely little river. And mostly, I suppose there's some degree of pollution in it. It starts off, like us all, pure and simple and carefree up in County Meath, I think. I've never been up at that end of it. And then it rolls on down. And as you go, you get different animals, different plants, and different scenes as you go along. Now, for instance, in the babbling brook end of things, you might get a little bird called the dipper. He'd be one of the exotics. A dipper is a little dark brown bird. It looks black. It looks like uh, the waiters of old that used to wear dark suits with a white front, you know, and bobs up and down all the time on stones. He's a a unique, a very special bird. He walks on the bottom of rivers and streams, believe it or not, looking for invertebrates and creepy crawlies, crawlies and things, you know. The Irish dipper is also unique. It is a unique subspecies of dipper, believe it or not. But this is one you could you could look out for. He has a funny kind. He dips. He stands in a stone. Little babbling waterfalls around him. Little brooks, 
white foam sort of thing, and he's bobbing up and down, probably as extra camouflage, probably as a way of um, tricking the eye into not noticing him. I think he is another little wave less uh, in the flow of the river, you see. Well, now he's one. Now he's the exotic. Well, um, then, of course, you have the great exotic of rivers, further down, perhaps up, perhaps up there too, the Kingfisher. Our friend. Ireland's most glamorous bird. Richard says you have to keep your eyes peeled to see a kingfisher. Now, usually you see them dashing off if you're watchful. They generally fly off downstream when you approach. Now, as you go down, he will return. He usually tends to do a circuitous route. He, he tends not to come back up the river again, but to fly around behind you and then out. But maybe that's just what has happened to the ones I've seen over the years. Kingfishers are, I suppose, the top class. The honours course, this is the first grade A if you see a kingfisher, because kingfishers will only live in areas where the, the river is just perfect. Because when God was making the kingfishers, he must have been having a laugh or something, because he said, you have to eat fish, but you can't swim. <laughs> Which is a bit mean, maybe. So the poor, thing, the poor kingfisher has to sort of perch and watch the water go by. And then if he sees a fish, dive in, grab the bloody fish and get out as fast as he can before he drowns, back up onto his perch and eat it there. So in order for the territory to be good for to be good for kingfishers, you first of all have to have a river with fish in it, a clean river. But you also have to have, have trees along the banks so that there can be a fishing post for the actual kingfisher to perch on. And then kingfishers also build their nests in the river banks and of course the, the roots of the trees act like i suppose like 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 mining shafts or something to, to to stop the to stop the actual tunnel collapsing in on top of the kingfisher so if you have kingfishers in an area you, you know that the the whole biodiversity is in place in the river and the river is fairly good so to see these of course is easier said than done everyone recognizes the kingfisher but you're more likely just to see a flash of blue going past or a flash of blue coming back because they go up and down and that's where they hunt but you if you could know and went enough around, you might even discover a fishing post and then you'd be like the photographers. You'd be able to get all these lovely swanky pictures. Herons. Herons are another one, another water bird. And again, these birds feed on fish and can't swim and they have to stand there all day waiting for the fish to go past. They're really the epitome of patience. So depending on how used they are to people, you might be able to get quite near to them. Some rivers have so few people walk up and down that the herons fly away at once. And other places where there's a lot of activity, the herons aren't so, aren't so fussed about people and you might be able to get to see them. Now, long ago, people called them cranes and they called them storks and things. But we only have the one bird like that with long legs and long bills standing on the water, dipping its bill in and feeding. There are so many birds that hang out around the rye. Aina and Richard know them particularly well. Myself and Richard Collins, we did a survey for Intel in 2004 on the river ride that runs at the back of their factory. And, you know, in those days, we spent a whole year doing this and we, we discovered that there were, we, we actually recorded 40, 47 bird species there, 29 of which were, were breeding. So we knew this because they were singing, they were holding territory, we might have even found nests or seen them with beaks full of food. So it's all action. So if you have trees, you have, you have the, so these will be the birds that will be singing, these will be the woodland birds who can be see, heard better than seen. So things like robins and blackbirds and thrushes and tits and chaffinches and those kind of birds, they were all woodland birds originally, and they communicated by sound rather than seeing each other. So they're the ones that you might see and more likely you will hear on those early mornings. Now, among the the uh, exotics or the, the sort of aristocratic, this is Owen Ree, after all, the River of the Kings. So you should be able to see otters if you're lucky, but you want to be very lucky with otters. Otters are, but you will see their signs. And when they enter the water, you see a little track, kind of a very faint track. And they have these sprints, as they call that is poo which is usually deposited on stones and things. And if you get a chance to smell it, it's a kind of fishy smell, which you can kind of get to like if you do it often enough. I might have to take Richard's word on that one. But speaking of fish, 
beneath the surface of the rye is teeming with life. And there's only one way to see it. Come on. Under the water, Liam, the unseen, the, un, the real unseen, there's things, there's the, the famous one is the, the white cloud crayfish. This is a crustacean, a kind of lobster-like creature. It can grow to about nine centimeters occasionally, maybe as high as the biggest 12. Now, it, Ireland is unique for this beast, I gather, because we have a population that isn't threatened by introductions. The ones elsewhere in Europe, in Britain, there are American crayfish brought in that are hammering it, and then there's a disease. There are several diseases, crayfish, poxes and things. Ireland is probably the last stronghold of that particular creature. Now, he's unseen, but he's there, as indeed are salmonids, salmon, trout. The fish that come in to spawn come up from the sea and they don't actually feed in fresh water. So they wouldn't be jumping up to catch flies or doing anything like that, that they only have one thing on their mind, I'm afraid, and it's not eating. <laughs> Just above the surface of the water and along the banks are all manner of insects. Then another one that you might see, and it does lots of these on the river, are things like, like dragonflies and mayflies. And these are, again, indicators of good river quality, good water, plenty of oxygen in the water. Because the way they operate is, I know you look at these stupid television ads and it says, oh, well, what you call it, a mayfly only lives for one day. That's rubbish. If it only lived for one day, what would it do? It only lives one day as an adult flying around, perhaps. But it lives maybe a year or two or three years as a nymph in the water. And as it's a nymph in the water, rather than a caterpillar in the case of a butterfly, the nymph in the water goes through various, various iterations, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually climbs up on the stalk, splits and gets its wings and has its adult state. So the adult state is what we would see flying around on the day, but they will have been in the water for quite a long time. And as you said, this this collection of wildlife happening in the water are the basis of, of the food chain there. But to just, just the dragonflies with the great big hawkers that go up and down, and then the lovely damselflies, the ones that have blue bodies and, and again, like in the bird world, the males get all the best colours. But you see them flying around again, oh, all summer long, different species come and go. You even get red ones, yellow ones, blue ones, green ones, all different ones, telling us that the water was clean enough for their nymphs to survive so that the adults then are the ones that we get to see. So that's why insects are fine. And of course, then, you know, if there's any kind of wildflowers, and again, depending on what the bank is like, because the river Rye is a limestone river, so it's calcareous plants that are around the banks, plenty of flowers there and you could get things then like bees things like hoverflies things like bumblebees other other creatures wasps these kind of various pollinators that will be there flying using the flowers then as sources of, of nectar for themselves to drink and indeed in the case of the bees they may well be collecting pollen to bring back as well to feed families at home because there's the young bees eat pollen and everybody else has nectar so they go into the pub for a drink really but most of them are at If you're going for a walk along the Rye, Aina says to enjoy it, but to leave it as you found it. You know, if there's paths along the way for people to go for walks and that, I mean, one has a duty not to throw rubbish in the river, not to pollute, not to break down things, and indeed to pick up and take away any any plastics and pollution that you might see that might end up in the river that's on the path. Because while most people are very aware of their environment, and particularly now in this year of COVID, when people are very much confined to a small area, a couple of kilometres around where they live, 
But there's still people who will throw stuff. There are still people who will pollute. And I mean, that's terrible. I mean, that should not be tolerated at all. So, I mean, people who go for walks on that, I mean, it's not no point in saying, well, I didn't throw it there. Why should I pick it up? That's not the approach at all. So, like, I mean, you should leave a, you should leave a place that you've walked looking better than it was when you came, if possible. And then you appreciate what's there. You enjoy it. You tell other people what a nice place it is. And you take it handy. You don't go marching along with your headphones stuck in your lungs and not hearing anything. To be able to, to see and enjoy it really means then that there's a body of people in Selbridge, a body of people in Leakslip, a body of people along that river who really appreciate the river. And that's really what makes the river so good because they're all prepared that it should be managed to make wildlife, make it good for wildlife and then indeed make it, make it more pleasant for everybody. What a wonderful walk through nature that was. My thanks to Aina Nilauna and Richard Collins. Next week, we'll be out angling with more Stories from the Rye. Stories from the Rye is proudly produced by Intel Ireland. This week, I'm going to leave the last word to our friend, the Kingfisher. <laughs>